Hello everyone, welcome to our video series, Western Unedited. Our voice, our story, our time. Today we will be discussing being black and brown at WIU. However, it is important that we tell you our, our mission statement. As Leathernecks, we recognize the opportunities and possibilities that Western Illinois University offers us. But as future leaders, we seek to improve inclusion and diversity, spread awareness about our experiences, and highlight the stories of marginalized communities on campus to provide a better future for generations of Leathernecks to come. Let's get started. My name is Derek Johnson. I'm a junior. I major in Law Enforcement and Justice Administration. I identify as he, him, and I identify as a black and Puerto Rican man. Hello, my name is Anthony. I'm a senior law enforcement major with a triple minor in forensic psychology, Spanish, and pre-law. My pronouns are he, him, and I identify as a Latino, Chicano, and Chicagoan. Hi, everyone. My name is Delilah. I'm a senior political science major. Uh, I'm from Springfield. Um, I identify with the pronouns of she, her, hers, and I identify as a black American. Hello everyone, my name is Mayani Montano. I use she, her pronouns, identify as Latina, and I'm a first year grad student in the Public Safety Administration program. So our first question today is, how would you describe your experience as a black and or brown student on campus? I feel like this just, as a black and brown student, I feel like very proud of my identity, of course. However, I just always feel that they're are extra steps that I have to take, and there are definitely certain stigmas that I have as a black and brown student on campus. Like, um, one thing for sure that it encompasses my entire experience is the fact that um, wherever I go, I always I feel like I have to do ten times more than just you know maybe a white white student or something like that, just to even get the same looks or recognition. So, if I were to describe my experience, it would just be. Maybe hard working, I have to work a little bit harder than everyone else. I mean, me personally, just being on campus as a, as a brown student, trying to just embody who my culture is. And I honestly have a lot of different identities. I know I, brought, I said three, but like, I, I could say, you know, I'm Mexican. I already said Latino, Chicano. A lot of people don't really, I don't know, know a lot about like being Chicano and what that means to, well, like, especially me, just like I don't like being called Mexican American. Like I hear those terms and like those terms are said to me. And I think it's just I'm always trying to embody my culture and embody who I am and show them that, you know, people from these backgrounds can be the best at, at these specific subjects, at the their jobs, at their work. So I'm always trying to, you know, do better than the next, do better than myself, really. So, yeah. Uh, to go off that, I kind of, uh, when I came here, like, uh, a lot of the guys that were in, in the organization that I joined my freshman year before me, like, they kind of set that example. So, like, my experience was to kind of be, be those guys, set, like, set that example. So, I'm, I'm always holding myself to, like, a higher standard than, um, than I probably should be or as I should. I'm not sure. Um, but, so, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like my experience is just working hard, like you said, hard working, just kind of trying to show them that what they think I am, I'm not. I think definitely like that hard working is a very good word to describe. Like my experience, I feel like, um, like at first when I came to Western, like I've shared before, like I definitely identified more with my like cultural identity now than I ever did. Like college was that time where I was able to really like, you know, learn more about my culture and really like feel like more prideful in it because I understood it more. But I also think that I had some experiences on campus where like I had to do more because kind of what you said, like we had to go like that extra mile just because of the situation that we're in and because of what we identify as. And I feel like even like the organization, the black and brown organizations on campus do so, so, so much and we are not recognized at the same capacity as other student organizations. And I think just even the resources, we're not given as many resources, whether that be funding or whatever the case may be, and we're just overall not recognized for all the efforts that we do. And it's like, yeah, there's like award ceremonies and all that, but it's like, it's just not, it's not equitable as much as I would like it to be. Um, so I think that overall, just like that aspect of like you said of hard working and like having to go that extra mile is something that I would describe as my experience. And in addition, like I want to touch a little bit, you know, you talked about the black and brown organizations. One thing I can also have about my experience here at WIU is I've also had a lot of joy because I grew up in Springfield in a very like suburban area, you know, 
from maybe, maybe K through 12, I mostly went to a majority white high school. So I didn't really get a chance to see or experience a whole lot of joy with my communities and subsequent communities. So when I got to you know, um, campus and all these beautiful black and brown organizations, I get to have fun with them, you know, be like, you know, feel included instead of like on the outside. So there's been a lot of joy with my experience on campus too, as well. I agree, I feel like there's a lot of support you know, yeah. on campus, like whether, whatever organization you're a part of, like the black and brown communities, like definitely support one another. And I think that that's something like really beautiful to see on campus. Yeah, they've got your back. Like when, when you feel like no one else does, you always feel like you have someone you can go to, right? And there's always an opportunity to learn, like all the different organizations, whether they put on events related to their culture, identity or race, whatever, like they put on events other than that too. And like just showcasing that just because you're a black or brown student doesn't mean that that's all you are. And that that's the only events you can put on have to do with that culture. Like. Like if you want to go to like a BSA event, you don't have to be a black student to go to a BSA event. All right, so um, something we're gonna do this video is we're gonna be sharing stories from other WIU students. So these are anonymous stories that, that were sent in. So the first story I have um, is from a young lady that goes to WIU. This is her story. She says, being black at WIU is being watched when you are at Walmart checking out. It's driving in town and seeing the Confederate flag on the back of pickup trucks and in front of houses. Being black at WIU is having to always advocate for yourself because if you don't, no one else will. It's being in a program that doesn't house many black students and having to be one of the three black kids in class. It's being the spokesperson for all black people because they perceive you to know how all other black people think. It's getting up every day, trying to pay attention in class while watching black bodies being killed and no consequences for the murder. Being black at WIU probably isn't that much different from any other PWI, which is predominantly white institution, but that doesn't make things easier knowing other black students are facing these same issues. Being black here is having non-black friend think, think uh, saying the N-word is okay because they grew up in the hood or having a lot of black friends. Ble being black period is extremely hard, but being a student is the worst. Everyone has these unrealistic expectations out of you because you are a low income student that has made it out of poverty. Being black at WIU is dealing with microaggressions and being told you're being sensitive. Being black here is having a very small black community and getting no funding for the organizations that are formed as safe havens for black students. Being black here is overcoming all the subtle racism this university refuses to do anything about and this town refuses to acknowledge. Being black at WIU is trying not to burn out because you are a full-time student at a racist school in a racist town. Do you have any thoughts about that? I don't know. I feel like that was that was very powerful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's kind of hit on a lot of different elements, or she hurt, hit on a lot of different mm -hmm. elements. But I think that um, one thing that at least like with my conversations with the people, you know, at Western and, and within the Macomb community, like there are people that do try at least. You know, like people understand. You know, so I've talked to like many like um, self-identifying like white people within Macomb, and like they they understand that it happens, and they 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 think i just talked to someone last night like they thank students for still coming and still you know being here at western because it means so much to, to the community the people that actually you know do like appreciate you know them being here so i think that it, it's unfortunate to hear, hear those experiences 100 percent. but i do think that there is always room for change 100 and i i do think that this person it's important to realize that you know us sitting at this table we have to realize that we're in a sense in the room. We're student leaders on campus, right? Our experience may be completely different from someone who chooses maybe just to go to class and maybe is involved in one organization. We chose to be very, very involved. So I think that this person, you know, I believe them. I believe that their story is valid and, and I just think that it shows that we've had different experiences and I, I'm really proud of this person for choosing to speak up and, and having their story read because just because you're not exactly someone important on campus doesn't mean that your experience is, is, is invalid. So I think, uh, you know, every, you know, I talk about this all the time, you know, black and brown people are not monolith. We all have different experiences, but um, even being a leader, I can, I can empathize with the things that this person has said, so. All right, so let's get on to the second question. What are some of the expectations, stereotypes we have experienced on campus being a student of color? I think going off of what that story, um, what she had shared, like being the spokesperson for the whole community. 
I think that I can definitely relate to that. You know, I'm always asked in different spaces of like, oh, tell me about like all of like, you know, what it means to be like Latina and like all the different experiences. And it's like, just because I'm Latina doesn't mean I can speak for all the people within the community, right? Like I, I'm Mexican and Puerto Rican, but I can't speak on what it's like to be, you know, Nicaraguan, Peruvian, like all these different um, Latin American cultures. And I feel like oftentimes because you're of that culture, you're expected to like represent or like know like everything about that. And especially being Mexican when it comes to like topics like immigration, I have no idea. So you're just expecting that I can speak on those things I can't. Or about indigenous cultures. I know of indigenous cultures within you know Puerto Rican culture. That doesn't mean I know about all indigenous cultures. You know, I think that a kind of an, a way to to describe it is if you're European, right? That doesn't mean you can speak on being Spanish, English, Irish. You can't speak on all those things because they're all different cultures. I think that that's something that is an expectation that you know being on campus is that especially if you're involved with like the multicultural center, you know all that there is about the multicultural center, and I don't, you know, so. To uh, go off her, uh, I definitely think like not being uh, academically uh, like uh, let, me re let me reword that like not not being like not having a high GPA. I, I feel like that that's can I, I feel like that is something that uh, is not really expected, and it's kind of a stereotype that like oh you probably have like um, kind of like a two point something. Um, and a lot of even guys in my org have went from a two point something in freshman year and now are at 3.5s, 3.6s. And it's, it's just like that they're changing, but they're always stuck with that stereotype that they still have a low GPA. They're not going to be um, the, the, the highest person in their class. Um, so it's just that stereotype of, of them not being where everyone else is, even though they are. So. Yeah, 100%. Like you know, if I go into like the scholarship office or something, you know, they're looking up like my data and everything and they're like, wow, you have a stellar GPA. And I'm like, as I should, like, is there, did you have a different assumption of me because of, you know, of my skin color and things like that? Or, you know, we talked about this last episode. Oh, you want to go to law school, you know, like, yeah, I do want to go to law school, you know. Well, law school is really expensive. Law school is very hard and, you know, all these stereotypes about the things that you can't do. Um, I refuse to subscribe to those stereotypes, but it kind of sucks that they're still, you know, out there, you know. Another uh, stereotype that I kind of experienced early on, not so much now, but, you know, uh, that I was from Chicago, right? And um, I think Chicago's a beautiful city. I love Chicago. I want to live in Chicago one day, but I'm from downstate Illinois. So, uh, but when I came here, people automatically assumed, like, I was from, like, you know, South Side Chicago and all the negative stereotypes that come from Chicago. Like I grew up with gun violence. My dad wasn't in my, my life or anything like that. So um, it really irks me because Chicago has so much beauty and history in it. And you know, um, it, it just takes a quick search to realize that, but people only think of the negative stereotypes and, and consequently they only associated me with the negative stereotypes of uh, um, being from Chicago. And the one the stereotype that's kind of uh, been pressing this week, especially with all the things that are going on in the news about, you know, um, you know, Dante Wright and things like that, is that I want to talk about that all the time. No. I'm going to tell you guys, like, this week has been extremely stressful with, like, class and, and then seeing all of these, you know, mass shootings and then police killing, you know, um, unarmed black people. And sometimes I just don't want to talk about that right now. I just have to live my life and, and try and make make sense of what I can. So the stereotype like in class that I want to talk about it, no, I, I don't want to talk about it right now, so. I know, like, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> I'm from the south side of Chicago. I grew up in those neighborhoods. I grew up with all those people and like, um, people are surprised when I tell them where I'm from. Like, they hear me talk, they might think it's weird and just like, I try to do the best I can and be part of all these organizations but people think like if you're part of those neighborhoods or like if you grew up in a certain area you won't be like successful or like knowledgeable on, on different things like I work on in the multicultural center too and I make it a point to know as much as I can of all the centers but like I don't I don't know everything and like you like you brought up Mayani like just because we work there we don't know everything I try to know everything, but there's always room to grow. And like, I think it's always like expected of me to like 
exactly talk on those things or like talk on CPD. It's like CPD just killed a 13 year old boy. Um, not too far from like where I'm from in South side of Chicago. And like when I tell people I'm a law enforcement major, like they say, oh, how do your parents feel like that? Feel about that? Oh, what do you, what do they think? Like, oh, that's crazy because of all the crazy stuff that's happening right now. Like people bring that up to me and I'm like, it's, that's just, those are issues. Like it's not crazy stuff that is happening. It's like, those are problems. Um, and like just seeing all those stuff that happens in Chicago, people expect me to be part of it or um, expect me not to be from Chicago because I'm not, I don't look like the stereotype that's from Chicago. Um, it's just crazy, to be honest. And then when I tell them that I'm, I want to be a lawyer instead of being like um, an officer or like a detective, something like that, they expect me to, I don't know, be part of like criminal stuff and things like that. And I tell them I want to be an immigration lawyer and they get surprised with that too. And then they start justifying it. Oh yeah, he's probably Mexican. So I am, I am Mexican, but I don't want people to assume that, right? Um, yeah, it's just some things to think about when looking at people. I think also like, at least like the experiences like that I've had or like the expectations, like for me, I haven't dealt with so many stereotypes because I'm pretty white passing um, or racially ambiguous, I guess. But I think a lot of the expectations that are of me is to also be able to share the experiences of other students. Like I've had in different organizations or in different, you know, spaces where I work, like it's always like, oh, like, can you share like the experiences of other people? And it's like, those aren't my experiences. Like I can, I can kind of give you a general understanding, but I can't share other people's experiences. They're not my own. I, can, I can't speak on those experiences, right? Or like, you know, I've had people ask me like, you know, so how is this racist? Like, what, what did I do? And it's like, why do I need to sit there and explain it to you? That is not my obligation as a student of color to have to explain how you're being racist. That's not my responsibility. And I feel like that's oftentimes, like, as, as a person of color, we're expected to have to explain everything and educate people. And it's like, that's draining. I don't want to have to talk about this stuff all the time. Why don't you ask me about, like, anything else? Ask me about how my day is versus asking me how something you said is racist to another student. Like, that, that's not on me to have to do that. Right. And, like, with the expectations thing, like, listen, like, don't get me wrong here. I am an advocate for my community and those subsequent communities, and I do know a lot, or, or at least I like to think that I do know a lot, but some days are just better than others, and I just cannot continue to, in a sense, surround myself with that trauma all day, otherwise I wouldn't make it out. But another expectation, like you were talking about, I want to talk about, like, for family, for, like, you know, we come from black and brown families, like, my expectation, like, now that they, my, my parents, now that they got me into college, like, I better be the best. That's a lot of pressure. And there's another thing, too. I'm the oldest daughter in my family, so that's a whole nother level. So whenever I maybe get, like, an A minus or maybe not, like, instead of, like, an A, or, you know, my mom's like, why didn't you get, like, a 4.0 or something this semester or, you know, or when I go to like family reunions and stuff like that, like my family's like, oh yeah, you know, my nickname's Lila. Uh, they're like, Lila, yeah, Lila's gonna be a lawyer. She can get me out of this. And I'm like, I, I haven't gone to law school yet. I, I haven't even gotten in yet. Like, can you guys, you know? So there's a lot of expectations I feel for my family. So, so much pressure. Like you keep adding it from your family and then, you know, the school has expectations of you, you know. Being leaders on campus, you can, you know that we get like a thousand emails a day. Can you do this? Can you do this photo shoot? Can you yada, yada, yada? And I'm like, I haven't even started on my homework yet. So there's a lot of expectations for black and brown students in general, but especially black and brown students who are expected to excel. It's the pressure is astronomical, really. I think we're expected like as, people of color that are also leaders to advocate for the school and to advocate for the administration just because we either have like high positions in organizations or employment with the university. But like, that's not the case if I, if I don't like something, like I'm gonna speak out against it. And I don't think all the administration sees that. I don't think they see that we're part of these communities, not just working for you, like we're working for, I don't know, for our community, if we see something like we don't like, I feel like they probably expect us to go along with it. So I just. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. That's great. I'll just say one stereotype that I've gotten 
more since I've been at Western than any other place I've ever lived is like, you know, people, you know, non Mexicans so are like, oh, what part of Mexico are you from? And I'm just like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, As I, if they would know, right? They're right. just asking and just like, to see. I, and I get that from students too. Like, students who identify as Mexican as well ask me that. And it's like, it's not even just non people of color or non color, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's like people who also are of that culture have these expectations. You'd be like other students, you know, like when I came to Western and like I had people talking to me about like DACA and I was like, I don't know. And they're like, well, how do you not know? And I'm like, because I just don't. I didn't have those experiences. So it's like, it's not even just other like people who don't identify as, you know, black or brown, like saying it's it's those communities too expecting you to know as well. And like to go off Anthony's point, like I think that's a really good point about like how when you in a sense, it's tokenism. Once they get you as a black or brown person in a position, they expect you to be the figurehead and be like, you know, uh, Western's great, yada, yada, yada. And you know, look, I love Western. Obviously, I chose to be here for four years, but I don't, I'll be like, I don't know what you thought this was, that I'm not gonna speak out about certain things or, you know, uh, the very few social media platforms that I have. Like, I'm gonna say something about the Black Lives Matter movement or, you know, or DACA or, you know, Pride Month or things like that. I'm gonna say things and, you know, I'm not gonna be censored. I don't, I don't know who you thought I was. And so if you thought I was one of those, you know, token, you know, people you were gonna just like let, you know, say good things about the university. No, my community always comes first. So, you know, uh, I feel like now in positions that I come in now, I have to make that very clear. Like, you know, if I see something's a problem, I'm gonna speak up about it. So that was a good point. So we have another anonymous story that I'm gonna be reading. During my second year at WIU, I was hired at a restaurant off campus, to which I was very surprised to see a majority black staff. That to me wasn't very common in Macomb. Every other food establishment only seemed to hire white girls with blonde hair, which is still the case four years later. Now, I am an Afro-Latina, but passed for only Latina. And at the time, and at the time was only Hispanic individual that worked there. About two months in, one of my coworkers, a white guy, who was about 20 at the time. He was having a conversation with another person about not being able to write with both of his hands. However, or being able to write with both of his hands. However, he couldn't remember the word. I spoke up and said ambidextrous. However, when I said it, I had mis mispronounced it as ambidextrous. To which he laughed and corrected me, then proceeded to say, well, considering this isn't your first language, I'm not surprised you said it wrong. At first, I was taken aback at his comment, but then, turn then it turned into anger. I looked at him and said, I don't speak Spanish, never have, and my minor is in English, so I think I grasped the language very well. To which he shrugged off and walked away. Now, over the years, I have heard various ignorant comments from customers regarding my appearance, nationality, and ethnicity. Ranging from, you're exotic, to, wow, you're very pretty and well-spoken for your kind of people. However, the worst comments weren't even the ones directed at me. They'd be the ones I'd hear in passing mainly coming from my manager. My manager was a middle-aged white woman, and there was one day where I overheard her speaking with two cooks in the kitchen who were black. The topic of discussion was about slavery and asking them if they were, if they were to have done it and if it would have been that bad. Another occasion, she was speaking to me about one of the men that works for an outside company that comes and helps the restaurant. He happened to be of Middle Eastern descent. She said to my face, excuse my language, I can't fucking stand foreigners. These foreign dudes are always trying not to do anything and to take your money. They're rude, can't stand them. Numerous employees stated that they've heard or experienced racist comments in the workplace either from her or other customers. The most heated argument I'd seen was the debate between my manager and the kitchen. The topic was Black Lives Matter and her ridiculous rebuttal of All Lives Matter. Now, she's saying this to an all-black kitchen staff and a majority black front of the house staff. The tension in the air was indescribable, as her own staff is trying to explain that their lives are important and aren't being viewed as that in society right now. But she continued to refuse to listen and have a conversation with them, only meeting them with an, well, I just don't know why you guys can't say all lives matter. I think... For me, not even at Western, like within like my own family, you know, like um, with my white side of my family, like I've definitely heard that 
that phrase, you know, all lives matter. My dad, who's Puerto Rican, also says, well, all lives matter. And it's like, that that's not what we're getting at, right? And it's not a matter of one life means more than the other. It's black lives matter too. And I feel like people are just so not willing to see it as that. They're just trying to see it as something opposite. And I've heard, you know, I haven't heard these, um, those, these kind of things like me personally on campus, but I definitely heard them in my own family. And like, it takes a lot to have to like educate and really like, like for me, like I told my dad, I'm like, okay, well, what about Malaysia? What about Eve? Like my little cousins who are half black. And I'm like, I had, I had basically explained to him, I'm like, it's not that their lives matter more, it's that their lives matter too. And I kind of like show them like that one graphic with the fists, how like there's like one fist like above the other. And so like what people think we're saying versus what, what we're actually saying. And um, it took me a long time to kind of like just get it through his head because, in, you know, for him, he's like, you know, well, I'm 100% Puerto Rican. Like, you know, I've been through these things too. And it's like, I told him, I'm like, well, what about Berto, one of his best friends who's black? And I'm like, you didn't experience that the same way that Berto did. You may have experienced some things, but not in the same way. And then I'm like, you know what it's like to be Puerto Rican. You don't know what it's like to be black. And I think that it finally, it finally clicked for him, right? But it's like having those conversations and having to be that person, how to explain it is very draining. And I'm sure it's very draining, especially, you know, for that student to be in that in that place being, you know, with the, with the, you know, conflicting identities also, like being Afro-Latina, like, that's hard. I'll tell you what, though, I don't, I'm past the point of thinking it's ignorance. I think it's willful ignorance. Yeah. I think people are purposely being ignorant for the purpose of being racist. You know what we mean when we say Black Lives Matter. It's been explained over the internet a thousand times. At this point, like, I decided, like, you know, maybe this, I think maybe in January or, um, December, I was like, you know, I'm done educating people. And, you know, if you, if you, if I say Black Lives Matter and you get offended by it, I'm assuming that you're racist and moving on because there's no way in 2021 on the internet that all this information, I can type in Black Lives Matter and come up with a thousand different pages of information on it. It's, it's willful ignorance. It's what it is. And so you choose to be ignorant. You don't care. You know what's happening. And you don't want to face it. So you just say all lives matter and you go about your life. I'd rather someone say that to me than try and, re and, try and rebuke me uh, or try and go against, refute what I have to say. Because uh, I'm done educating people. So I, I feel really, really sorry um, for that, that person who had to you know, work in that environment, that toxic environment. I know that had to play with her psyche every single day, but um, yeah, uh, that's basically what I would say. Like if, if, if someone tries to say all lives matter or, you know, white lives matter or something like that, it's willful ignorance. They know what they're doing, move on, you know, and, and, and try and find people, you know, um, who actually care about the cause and actually are trying to be actively anti-racist. You know, like there were instances in there uh, from what I remember, two instances that somebody was trying to be edu was trying to educate them. One from the coworker told, like, obviously checked them on they don't speak Spanish, and then was just shrugged off. Like, that's willful, willful ignorance. Yeah, the manager is getting checked on what they're saying. Not even checked on it. They're not coming at them. They're just telling them information, trying to explain it to them. And was, she's just blowing it off too. So I mean, at that point, there's no there's no help in them. Like uh, another aspect of this is it, it's all like there's stories I've heard uh, from some friends of mine. It's always like upper management that is saying it to the general level workers. So it's 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 that kind of power thing. Like you can't do anything to me. You are you are kind of submissive to me. If you go against what I say, then you can be released just like that. So it's it's kind of like like that learned helplessness type of feel, where you don't say anything. So you kind of just feel helpless, and that's kind of what they, that's exactly what they want. Um, I, there's been stories from uh, the dining hall in Corbin Olsen, um, where a, an upper management person uh, called, uh, called one, one, this one girl or guy, I forget uh, who told me, but they called him a monkey, like flat out monkey. And the, the person told me this, and he's like, man, uh, it, it was a guy, now that I'm thinking about it, he's like, man, if, if he wasn't my boss, like, I, I would have, you know, but 
you know, it's, it's kind of like that, that power. So it's like they're, they're kind of helpless in the sense that they need that job. They're in college. They need these jobs. So they don't want to do something wrong to lose that job and possibly lose their entire college experience. Yeah, no, and it's like I feel like black and brown people constantly feel that power structure no matter where we go. The chances are, right, like, you know, us three, we want to go into law school. I can guarantee you, I haven't even stepped foot into law school yet, but 90% of our professors will be white, right? 90% of the administrators will be white. You know, it, we already know walking into a room that we're not going to be the dominant spot, dominant place of people in spot, unless it's like a B-man retreat or like, you know, Latinx Heritage Month, and we have people like that. That's the only time, but, you know. And another thing that really bugs me is like with the whole education thing, it's like, you say, for example, you're talking to someone about Black Lives Matter, and they're like, well, well, educate me. It's not my job. You came to me with this problem. You should educate yourself, you know. I, that. It's like me giving a presentation and then, you know, um, people ask me questions. Well, educate me. I'm the one giving the presentation. I'm telling you that I'm supposed to be the one. I'm no longer accepting that either. Well, I just haven't been educated. Where have you been? You've been underground? Because every major news station, every, every place on the internet, Twitter, Instagram, is talking about it. So it's willful at this point. All right. Um. I do want to say a final remark, like <laughs> administrators tend to be protected and if people don't speak up, they're going to continue to be protected. And I just see that issue happening and continuing to happen. So hope everybody speaks up. All right, next question. So what do conversations regarding mental health look like in black and Latinx communities? So to kind of begin, uh, so my, my org actually had like a talk about this. Um, so from, from a guy's point of view, um, like men are kind of expected to have a higher, uh, or a higher uh, tolerance of like their mental health, especially as a black man. Uh, it's, it's, it's even kind of up more. I, I have no idea why. Um, but there's this one guy in, in my org and uh, he said, you know, he, he doesn't open up. And this, this one girl he was talking to uh, kind of like forced him to open up and you know, he, 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 he let it all out. He kind of, he became emotional with her. Uh, and at, like he felt, he, he was like, man, I, I finished talking to her. I felt like, like wow, I, I let it off my chest. And then as soon as that happened, she said, man, that was really soft of you. And it was, it was at that moment that he's like, he's like, so, so how should I feel? Like, like I trusted this girl, and like this is why I don't open up. So like it, it's it, it's that it's that you know we want to open up, and then when we open up, it's kind of rejected. So then we stay closed. Um, so it, it was just an interesting thing to see that like, you know, and like th this dude, this dude's huge. He's like six five, like two something. Like and like he 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 was able to let that let that image go and be emotional with this girl, and she kind of saw him as soft. So like, I, I, now this guy's gonna be shut down forever. So it's just, it's just like kind of that, that mental health is just always disregarded uh, as a man and as a man of color, especially, um, which really like kind of just doesn't allow men to ever really open up because you don't know how it's gonna be taken, so. And I feel like black men especially, you, they have in the black community, I'll speak for the black community, there's like this stigma that you have to be tough, masculine, take care of things, no crying, you just, you can't be soft or anything like that. And that's so detrimental to our community because I always think about all the problems that would be solved if someone just talked to someone, you know? Um, but um, also with like mental health, like, so this is kind of like personal to me because like, you know, in 2019, before the pandemic kicked, this was before the pandemic, I was diagnosed with two really debilitating mental illnesses. And, you know, to this day, I really still can't talk about it because I have so much shame, guilt, you know, and I know I shouldn't feel that way, but I can't help because of the way my family has perceived me. Like, you know, they're like, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? Like, you know, when they say things like that, it just takes everything out of me. I just want to go hide. So for a while, I, I, try, I, I still hide it from my family. There are people in my family that I talk to every day that don't know 
what I, what I was going through because of that shame and that guilt. In the black community, mental illness is just not talked about. You sweep it under the rug or, you know, or what you got to be, you know, depressed for or something like that. You know, you, you grew up with this, you grew up with that. Like, we had to walk to school and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, you know, well, I opened up to you and then you shut me down. And, and you know, also another thing is like in the workplace, right? When I had to tell some of my supervisors I had to take a leave because um, of my mental illness, like, I just remember that day, like, the way they looked at me changed. You could see it in their eyes. Like, they always thought, oh, Delilah Strong, she's got this, you know, she's put together. But then the moment I told them, like, the way they perceived me was so, so different. That stigma, it hurt. So, like, I was even nervous just even to say that I have, like, a mental health problem uh, on camera today because I just don't want people to see me differently. But that stigma in the black and, and brown community, it follows you everywhere and it, it just gives you so much shame. I think for sure, because like I definitely like related to like one thing that you said, like um, that's something like people in my family have said like, oh, you have nothing to really be depressed about. And it's like trigger warning. Like I've had people in my family say like, oh, people who, you know, self-harm, like they just want to do it for attention. Like that's not true at all. And for someone who, who used to self-harm, like, no one knew like my parents didn't know for almost five years because like I just didn't tell them so it's not about wanting attention and you know when my dad finally found out he was like that's pathetic and I love my dad he's apologized for his comments since then but it's like especially like my brother like my brother has uh I forget what it's called but he has a specific um diagnosed like form of depression and because of how mental health is like within my family like he, he hates therapy. He, like, he doesn't want to do it. He did it when he was younger. He just shuts down. Like, he just doesn't. Like, therapy and, like, especially in, like for me, I'm speaking on, like, the Latinx community, it's, like, very, like, frowned upon. It's, like, you're not a real man if you can't handle it. Like, you know, especially when it comes to, like, um, people who have gone through, um, like, a lot of, like, for example, like, immigration and stuff like that who have con- go- gone to, like, a whole different country. It's, like, they have something to be, you know, upset about or, or depressed about. Um, But someone like, you know, in our situations, like we don't. So it's like it's like this huge stigma within, I feel like, both communities that I think that a lot of people disregard. And I think also like at least like on campus, too, like we have a counseling center and the counseling center is great. Right. I've been there. It's 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 awesome. But there is a lack of representation for our students of color there. Um, Because a lot of times people don't like to speak to counselors who may not be able to share the same experiences, hence like their race. Because that's like a big thing that people struggle with, is a big thing and they can't talk about it because the other person may not understand. I feel like that's something that uh, I would love to see the university definitely like work towards is like getting more representation in the counseling center so that people with mental health issues or maybe not even diagnosed but just you know just want to talk they feel that they can because there's someone there who can relate to them that will listen to them yeah I, I got it. there's there's also like that that like oh he he's the same as me type of feel so I, I definitely get that, that representation there's people who I've spoken to where you know like like opening up you, you need to feel like that person knows where you're coming from um, so we definitely need that, that representation in the uh, counseling center I just think it's uh, another thing about like you know when it comes like talking about the community right the problem I feel like sometimes well this is just maybe my experience maybe someone else can cor- relate but talking to my black family about it they don't want to talk about it because they know that they are a part of the problem and then it, it's pointed back at them like you know well, mom, you know, when I was depressed in middle school, you know, well, that never happened. Or, well, we had it way worse than you did. I'll tell you this, you know, so they don't want to admit that they're a part of the problem. Like, you know, one thing about the black community and specific, like what happens in this house stays in this house, right? So any problem that I may have had, I couldn't even talk to anybody because we're telling everybody our business and things like that. They perpetuate that, right? And so when talking about mental health, it's kind of a sore spot for them because one, they perpetuate it, but two, when they maybe were going through the same things maybe 30 years ago, no one helped or protected them, right? So it's hard, like, you know, when I told my mom like I was starting therapy, well, she was like, well, when I was your age, I didn't get therapy you know, or, you know, your, your aunt didn't get therapy or anything like that. It's a, it's, there's a bitterness, right? Because 
no one reached out to them and helped them when they needed it. You know, so I think that, you know, when I have children in the future, I'm gonna break that curse and be like, if you need help or if you start experiencing these things, because, you know, mental, mental illness is passed on. If you start experiencing these things, you can go to someone and there will be no stigma. I just do feel guilty about all the black and brown people who weren't reached out to when mental health wasn't, was taboo back then, but it's not as taboo now, you know? Touch on that tabooness real quick. I think also within the Latinx community, there's such an emphasis on shame and like the family name. And like, it's like, oh, if you talk about this, you're going to bring shame upon your family. Or like, oh, you know, they're going to cheese me out about it. Like, they're going to gossip about it. And it's like, why, why does that matter? Why is, you know, the fact that someone may gossip about it or talk about it, like, that's more important than my health, my mental health, you know, stuff like that. And I think that. That, that, that tabooness, like that stigma also relates to like, it goes back to the family. It's like not even, it's like not even like your issue, it's like the whole family's issue and it's like you're making it a thing for the whole family and like that's a big thing as well in the Latinx community I've seen. Yeah, I, there's been times where like, like literally we will be going to a family party, we'll have this entire episode like at the house and then as soon as we show up to that party, it's like nothing ever happened. And like, that's kind of like, uh, symbolic of like how we treat our, our mental health. We can be going through it, but like, like just, just a rant. I, I could I could have been going through it right before I came here, and I come here and it's business. Like like I, I'll be able to hide that, and like, like I'm not. I feel like that's just that's kind of symbolic of of the Black and Latinx community. It's like you can be going through it, but when it's time to to show people what's going on, you're not going through it. So yeah, I feel like if there's a weakness, especially mentally, within our communities. Um, the trust and like people that look up to you are like, this might not be true, right? But this is how it's seen. Like, if you show that weakness, you're not gonna be trusted to do things anymore. Like, I want to be a person that somebody can confide in to get something done because I pride myself in that. Like, I don't wanna feel powerless or like not being able to do something, especially because I can't talk to people about it. Um, I know, like, Everybody, y'all have all hit on like great things. Like, what is making you sad? Why are you sad? Who's making you sad? It's like, that's not what it is. But yeah, definitely s switching back and forth, definitely resonating with that. Like, I have to get stuff done. And sometimes it's just, I have to push myself off to the side. Like, I'll take care of that when I'm done with everything, when I'm caught up and I'll take care, I'll take care of it by myself. But then we have people like, you know, people who like that, who do that, and they never get to it. So they go their whole lives dealing with this, and then they marry, they have kids, and they, and they pass it on to the same kids, and the kids keep repeating the cycle. That's why I think it's important, and I'm really glad that in the last maybe 10, five to 10 years, we've been talking more about mental health, you know, in specifically the black and brown community, because for a while it was just so hush-hush, like, you know, I, I have an aunt who, who dealt with mental health problems. And I remember being like eight or nine and um, this person, she you know, tried to commit suicide and things like that and uh, no one talked about it. I was like, where is this person? Don't worry about it. And I'm like, what if that was me? Would I just be a don't worry about it? Would I just be pushed aside in the corner for no one else to just talk about? And that really, really hit me, you know, as a child. And I carried that throughout my life. So I'm still trying to unlearn some of the things that I learned, you know, um, growing up. Like, I stopped saying that, you know, oh, you're just being crazy. I stopped saying that because it's hurtful and it was meant to degrade people. But it's a lot of unlearning from what you learn in your community as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have another story. Uh, this is a short one. Uh, she says... Being black at WIU is scary at times. Being black in WIU or in Macomb, period, is going to the gas station and being harassed by older white men because of the color of my skin. Being black here is white people telling me they are Trump supporters without me having to ask. It's having to feel like I have a target on my back. It's toning down my personality f for others to feel comfortable. Having heads turn to look at you when the topic of race is brought up into the conversation. I, I understand, like, I, I remember being the only black kid in, like, K through 12, and, like, when slavery comes up, like, everybody's like, you know, even if I didn't even know what slavery was, you know, I was just learning with them, like, you know, at six years old, and 
I, I understand, you know, um, um, about the Trump supporter thing, like especially last election season, it was just really hard, you know, um, I always like have me and my friends of color always talk about like, you know, we kind of assume people are Trump supporters until, white people are Trump supporters until otherwise stated because it's just easier that way, right? Um, because of what happens and, and, and what Trump himself signifies. So, um, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely, you know, I am white and I still like, I get uncomfortable around other white people because I'm like, oh, are they Trump supporters? Cause like you just assume and like not all people are, all, not all, all white people are Trump supporters, you know? Not. Of course, but it's like, we're just so prone to like be on the defense all the time. And like just kind of like, it's like that defense mechanism of just like having to assume just to keep yourself like more comfortable or safe. Right. And it's not, and it's different, right? Cause some, you know, maybe a white person will watch this will be like, well, how is that different from assuming that all black people are uneducated or anything like that? Okay, <laughs> I said I'm not gonna be the educator, but it's a complete different thing because ours is more in a defense and protection. Yours is just based off stereotypes that you see, um, that you've seen one person do, right? So it's, it's a lot different from us, you know, going into it with defense, right? We wanna assume the otherwise. We wanna assume that you're with us, but you already other us when you when you make those stereotypes about us. So there's a complete difference, right? So the next question is, in terms of the classroom setting specifically, what have been your most memorable experiences as a student of color here at Western? Um, I feel like there's a lot, for some reason people always ask me for questions, like come to me for to, for questions, and you know, it's it's always rewarding to see like I'm the, I'm doing the best in the class, like so. I feel like that's one of the, the most like memorable experiences because you know like, like having people come up to you and ask you questions because they they see that you're in class all the time they see that you're answering questions that you're asking questions um, I don't know it, it's just it's just very very rewarding to see that like what you're doing in class is being recognized and people are coming to you because of what you're doing. I just feel good being in class, right? <laughs> I recognize that, you know, well, not every time, trust me. But I recognize that, you know, um, my ancestors and, and my family paved the way so that I could get into college, and I just, I recognize it as a privilege, you know. I know there are tons of people in college, but it's still a privilege to be at a university and in class. So I'm happy to be in class, and I'm happy to represent my community well, I think, and. I just, uh, I kind of agree with Derek. I, I like, you know, being engaged and, you know, having my input on things taken seriously, you know, because, you know, um, most people don't know about this, but um, black students weren't allowed in Western until the 70s. And they weren't allowed into the residence halls until even a little bit later after that. So, you know, just a little Western trivia. So the fact that, you know, 40, maybe 40, 50 years later, here we are, we're sitting in this class and we're being taken seriously as leaders on campus is so, rewarding it is I think some of my most memorable experiences um, where I've had professors allow me to kind of like speak to the class about things not even like about race just like educating them on specific things like I had a class I think Anthony were in my class when I talked about like pronouns and like gender versus like sex and stuff like that and like because the professor kept saying you know some term and I was like mm. You know, and like he didn't know as a cisgender white male, he didn't know. And, and I, you know, told him like, hey, like professor, like, would you mind saying it this way? And instead he goes, actually, would you want to talk to the class about that? And I was like, I would love to. Like, thank you for, for you know, giving me the opportunity. I've had other classes where professors have allowed me to talk about like my student organization events. You know, they're like, oh, this would be a great event to talk to the class. Would you, would you share that? And it's like, I appreciate those experiences, not only, you know, about the class itself, but the professors who were willing to like not only hear like about the things I was doing on campus, but just like also just be, be becoming more educated within like um, within the specific programs. Um, what was I gonna say? I'm gonna say something else. Probably Anthony talk. <laughs> yeah. So I just love giving presentations and like seeing how the professors respond to what I'm saying and like how the students respond to me being so knowledgeable on the subject. Um, and just that if they commend me after the after the presentation, like yes, like I knew everything and I can speak on topics. I can speak to a classroom full of people who I might not even identify with, but I can educate them. And it's just speaking any time in class, any 
absolutely any time that I speak. I know there was times where people were giving a presentation on um, different groups and they brought up, they brought up a Black Lives Matter group and they very sneakily uh, categorized them as like a hate group. And I like, no, like, that's not okay. And I told them the difference. Like they brought up different groups. And I told them like people can um, exaggerate people's missions, but they're not part of the mission. You know, people take missions and make it an excuse to act a certain way that doesn't revolve around the whole. And so I like bringing stuff up like that. I corrected a professor on saying that Mexico was like part of Central America or something like that. That's not a huge deal, right? But it's a huge deal to me because Mexico is North America and I am American regardless of if I was born in America or not. And I make that a point to bring up all the time. And the professor was, was you know, not arguing with me, but he's the professor, he's the one teaching us. And I corrected him in front of the class. The very next class he came back, you know, told me that I was right, that he looked it up. And I mean, obviously I knew that I was right, but those are rewarding experiences to like correct people on certain things that they're saying wrong or like be one of the best presenters in the class because I pride myself on being able to speak on things. I pride myself on being able to speak to a group of people and just get my ideas across, being able to efficiently communicate. So just because people expect me not to be well-versed in speaking or to have an accent all the time, to not be able to code switch or like to be able to talk to my different audiences. So I love showing that off. And that, that the professor acknowledged that you were right yeah. and I like, said like you know I'm sorry like you were actually right I think that's like that's like a huge thing you know for students to be able to have that you know acknowledgement from you know a person in a power position right a professor I think that that was really great I think that also I've seen like especially with COVID times right like discussion posts I've seen a lot of like discussion posts you know talking about those issues as well that we can kind of like get the conversation going and it's not on us to get those conversations going is that if that makes sense i feel like when i was in the physical classroom if there was a topic it's kind of like they're like looking at you you know the black and brown students in the room to kind of like speak on it versus in a discussion post you don't know anybody's you know race it's kind of like you all ha are forced to kind of talk about it which i think is really important yeah there was a sparked a memory this uh there was a discussion post where we were talking about um, reparations, right, for the black community. And one girl was like, well, I don't think there should be reparations because no one who, who, who no one's alive who ever owned slaves ever. So obviously me, I was like super, I was like, okay, let me explain something to you. So, um, you know, I'm very, actually very proud of this. I, I have proof that my great, great grandmother was a slave. You know, so I have proof we have her documents and things like that in our, our family house, but we had things like that. So I was like, actually, um, <laughs> my great grandmother was a slave. So that means that my grandmother's grandmother was a slave. So people who haven't been affected by it are still alive. My grandmother's still alive. Also, you know, even though uh, people have never owned slave, there are people who are still affected by slavery, namely black people and white people who still benefit from slavery almost 100 years later. So. Um, she ended up deleting the post, so bye. Um, but I was like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm kind of like proud like Anthony is, like, you know, being that person who will speak up. Like, you know, um, if someone gives me a look like, did you hear that? I'm like, uh, professor, you know, like, uh, no, you know, I, I feel obligated to say something that that wasn't correct or that person is wrong. So, yeah. All right, so we have another story. Uh, this one comes from a uh, man. So uh, he states, so my family came to visit one weekend, my mom, dad, younger brother, and cousin. When I met them at the restaurant for dinner, I brought two friends with me. We entered the restaurant and stood in the lobby area waiting to be seated. As we stood there, another group walked in of about six to seven people. Their group was all white. Our group was multi-race, black, and my mom is white. We had been standing for a couple minutes, so we thought we would sit down when the table became available. At this point, no one has even said a word to us. <laughs> Almost immediately when the group of white people came into the, into the place, they were greeted with a, hey, we'll be right with you. 
Then they looked at our group and said, just a minute. The, the greeters, coworkers, we were arranging a table. I thought, I thought it would be for us because we were waiting about five minutes before the group of whites showed up and that's what normally happens at restaurants, but Macomb is different. So we finally sat down and then they made us wait again. We were all wondering where our waiter was so we could at least have water. After about five to 10 minutes, she came and asked if she could get our drinks. We ended up leaving the restaurant because it was so blatantly ob obvious that they were doing these things on purpose. You know, again, you know, I think I speak for the table as black and brown people, we've all had experiences like that in restaurants, like, you know, people not wanting to serve because they don't think black people don't tip or, you know, we're going to be rowdy or, you know, just all types of things. So I, I definitely relate to that experience, just feeling like, you know, or being, you know, if I go out with my mom or like my friends and we're the only people of color in the restaurant feeling like, should we be here? Are we allowed here? Or, you know, in, in that sense, like I know I'm allowed here, but in the sense that I feel like maybe this restaurant isn't for me. Um, so I understand that for sure. All right. So next question. What issues do we wish were more discussed with the black and brown communities? I think we brought it up before, like the mental health aspect. Um, personally, I, I wish it was more talked about the fact that sometimes the black and brown communities don't see each other as allies and don't see that some of us go through the same, the, like the same things and like Latinx people are also black. <laughs> like I don't think that's seen and there's a huge like stereotype with, I mean the whole thing having to do with colorism, like they don't see that there could be some, uh, a Mexican person who is also black. There could be, you know, a Puerto Rican who is also black. Like, not even saying, um, oh, my mom's Puerto Rican, my dad's black. No, like, they are Puerto Rican, but they are Afro-Latinos. Like, they're still black. They will identify as black. And I just don't see sometimes that these groups don't want to help each other. They might say, like, oh, well, this is not your struggle. Don't worry about it. Like. To people of power, to people in the majority, we're seen as the same. Like, I see that all the time. And yes, I am, I'm lighter skinned. I definitely see that, definitely see the privilege in that. I'm not driving somewhere and immediately seen as a minority, but if I'm stopped, then they understand that I am. You know, it's a, it's a second step for me. Besides like if I was a darker skinned, it would be the first step. But it's still a thing where if we don't help each other, then our groups are separated and not as powerful as we could be. Just wish that was talked about. And a lot. I agree, you know, with discussing the dynamics between the black and brown community. Well, one thing I wish is that, you know, black people, and particularly talking about my community, for some people don't think that we can be affected by immigration like the Latinx community is. And I'm like, oh boy, you're so wrong. You have no idea how much that affects us, right? And then too, on the brown side, I wish that, you know, um, you know, Latinx people could recognize that, you know, although for the most part, we're relatively on the same, you do have a little bit of a step above us because of your proximity to whiteness, right? There are white Latinos who can get away with it and they have, you know, Latinx last names and that may stop them in the future, but, um, Black people are perceived as black immediately, and that 100% affects our experiences as well. And um, you know, uh, so it, there there are a lot of dynamics between the black and brown community. Colorism is is pervasive, 100%. Um, you know, I think that um, I wish in my community specifically we talk more about like safe sex and things like that because I feel like that's something we just don't discuss at all you know, and uh, gender identity and things like that. I wish those conversations would be had more. And But in general, I just wish that the black community would really leave the what's happens in my house stays in my house thing back in the 80s where it belongs because I'm sick of that, like, you know, how we would be so much further if we could talk about our experiences and things like that. And I think the new generation, we're getting to that, but, you know, um, the old heads or anything like that, they don't want to talk about it and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah. 
colorism. I think that I've been learning that more recently within the last couple of years that like colorism, like at least like in my community, like I've been hearing about it a lot, like colorism within the, you know, the Latinx community, but like it's also very prevalent in the black community. Like there's like a huge stigma against like light skin versus dark skin. That's the same in the Latinx community, right? Like I'm seen as not Latina enough because I'm white passing and it's like, it's the same thing. You're not seen as black enough because you're light skin. Like we go through those same those same concepts. Maybe not in the same severity, but we go through those same types of issues. That I feel like, again, like what Anthony said, like we kind of need to come together and be like, yeah, we all kind of experience. Let, let's talk about. It. Let's share different experiences, you know. And I think that within the Latinx community, I think that we've, from you know my you know my experience, the people who I've been you know in conversations with, we started to realize how you know, maybe our families or different things that we've done in the past can be seen as anti-black. And I think that from what I've seen like on social media and like within like, you know, my friends and stuff like that, like the black community can also be anti-Latinx. And I feel like those are conversations, you know, agree to disagree, right? On like whether or not other people can be racist towards, you know, like other cultures. Um, and I think that that's something that we don't, we don't talk about, like that we're kind of at, at odds with each other too. Like we, we tend to kind of like see each other as not the enemy, but like it's always like, well, I have it worse here. Or it's like, well, I have it worse here. It's like, we all need to get past that. We all need to like get past that and kind of fight the bigger battles than each other because we're not at war with each other. We're at war with the system and like higher higher power. That's what we're really at war with, not each other. 100%, I can tell you right now that I've heard black people say things that are completely out of pocket about Latinx people and I try and call them out and, and they say, well, they ain't worried about you, they ain't defending you or something like that. And I'm like, well, with that mindset, they never will, right? So it's definitely coming together and discussing that, but I also wanna give a definition of colorism for those who may not know. It's basically colorism is the fact that if you are lighter skin and, you're close, and your proximity to whiteness is closer, you have more advantages in the world than people with darker skin, right? It's been proven, like there are statistics that say that those with lighter skin get less you know, uh, jail sentences, they're more likely to be considered innocent, promotions and jobs and things like that. So if you are a black person with lighter skin, you're more likely to be perceived more attractive, spe specifically with like black women. The darker you are, the more masculine or things like that. It affects everybody, so um, brown and black communities. So that's what colorism is, if people don't know. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to this episode of Western Unedited, our voice, our story, our time.